Welcome to the Voice of Prophecy, a voice crying in the wilderness of these challenging days. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. This is Kenneth Richards. Today we have a special program for you. It's a program from our archives, which features the preaching of the founder of the Voice of Prophecy, my father, H.M.S. Richards. This program was first aired in 1981. We trust that it will be a blessing to you. In addition to the sermon by H.M.S. Richards, we'll hear the music of the King's Heralds and Del Delker. Next week, we'll return to our regular programming. Lonnie Meloshenko will present another in his series on Bible prophecy. But now, relax and enjoy this vintage program featuring the ministry of H.M.S. Richards. The 1981 program began with a selection from the King's Heralds. Their song was, Come to Me. Here it is. Listen, everybody, come right now to me. Listen, everybody, come and be free. And be free. Through the war and the hate that's troubled us since our birth. Comes a voice from the clouds that's heard through the whole earth. A thousand speakers in a thousand towns Everybody's heard but few have found The man they've all been shouting about And still the man cries out Come, come to me Rest your body Listen, everybody, come right now to me. Listen, everybody, come and be free. And be free. We talk about love and the freedom of our mind. But we'll never outrace this mad circle of time. Nothing and that's how we leave The answer is there But nobody sees The sands in the glass Are running out And still A man Cries out Come Come to me Rest your Listen, everybody, come right now to me. Listen, everybody, come and be free.
Friend, there is no better time to come to Jesus, no better time to open your heart to Him, than now. Will you do it? In conjunction with today's broadcast, we'd like to send you a free book entitled Our Lord's Second Coming. This book lists every passage in the Bible that talks about the second coming of Jesus. It's an excellent resource for study and encouragement. At the close of the broadcast, I'll tell you how to get in touch with us, so be sure to have a pen and paper ready. The next song in this vintage program is a perennial favorite. Listen as the King's Herald sing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain Now here's my father, H.M.S. Richards. His subject today, Stories of Christ's Return. Thank you, son. All too few Christians today are really looking for Christ's return to the earth. They seem to forget that Jesus said, I will come again. That's John 14, 3. The parables of Jesus are interesting stories that he told to illustrate the truths that he was teaching. They're both popular and helpful, And down through the ages, people have enjoyed them. It's interesting to note that a number of these wonderful parables or stories Jesus told deal with his return to this earth. Along with Christ's preaching on this subject, they stirred the minds and comforted the hearts of those who loved the Scriptures. Great Bible interpreters and great preachers, too, have received help from these doctrines of Christ's second coming, as found in these wonderful stories Jesus told. Notice these words from Dr. G. Campbell Morgan, who was indeed a mighty preacher, as well as a great Bible student and Bible storyteller. He says, To me, the second coming of Christ is a perpetual light in the path, which makes the present bearable. I never lay my head on my pillow without thinking that maybe before the morning breaks, the final morning may have dawned. I never begin my work without thinking that perhaps He may interrupt my work and begin his own. This is his word to all believing souls, until he comes. Let us look at two of these great stories Jesus told that refer to his second coming to this world. First, the story of the ten virgins found in Matthew 25th chapter, the first 13 verses. We will read first the story just as it is. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. 
but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, that is, while he waited, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose, trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. Now that's an interesting story, isn't it? This story ought to stir the hearts of all of us. Notice, it pictures personal preparation for our Lord's return. It reveals that His coming may seemingly be delayed. It proclaims our need of the Holy Spirit to be prepared for Christ's holy advent. In Scripture, oil is often the symbol of the Spirit. The five wise virgins had a supply of oil that the others did not have. In the darkest hour, at midnight, the cry went forth, He's coming! He's coming! The bridegroom is coming! But the foolish virgins had no oil. Their lamps had gone out, or were going out right then. And they were unable to welcome the bridegroom. What a lesson for us today, in this hour of the world's history. The message of our Lord's return is resounding over all the earth. Yet only those people whose lights are burning, only those whose faith is strong, only those whose lives are filled with hope and trust by the power of the Holy Spirit of God will be ready for that hour. Notice that in the story, only those who were ready were allowed to go into the marriage supper. And when they'd gone in, it says, the door was closed. Others came and desired entrance but were not permitted to go in. The door was shut. You see, friends, there's a time for everything in God's great plan. The great decision was already made. Yes, the door was shut. This story that Jesus told regarding events connected with his second coming reminds us of an experience a visitor to India had years ago at a marriage celebration. The bridegroom came from a long distance to the home of the bride at Sarampur. After the guests had waited for two hours, at last, near midnight, it was announced as if it were the very words of Scripture, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Everyone now lighted his lamp and ran to find a place in the procession. Some had lost their lamps in the crowd or had let them go out. There was no oil at hand to refill them. They were unprepared. It was too late for them. So the procession started without them to the home of the bride. There the guests entered a large illuminated area in front of the house, covered with an awning. A large company of friends had gathered, dressed in their best apparel. They were seated on mats on the ground. The bridegroom was carried on the arms of friends and placed on a special seat in the midst of the crowd, where he sat for a short time, then went into the house. The door was shut and guarded by armed men. The person who saw this oriental wedding said that he and others expostulated with the doorkeeper for entrance, but in vain. Never before, he said, was I so struck with our Lord's beautiful parable than at this moment, and the door was shut. Think of those words seriously, my friend. The door was shut. It was shut and locked, fastened apparently. It's open now, but someday it'll be shut. Now let us take the second story that Jesus told about his second coming. It's found here in Mark 13, beginning with the 32nd verse. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even 
or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly find you sleeping. What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. In this story, the Savior again emphasizes the fact that he will return. He went away from this earth as a man taking a far journey. He left authority with his servants, authority to do his work here on earth. He gave to every man his particular work. So we are all responsible to work for him. One of the most important of his commands on leaving was to watch, to be alert, for we do not know when he will return. Therefore, we must keep ready all the time. We must not be found sleeping. The great teaching of this wonderful story is that we are to watch for the Master's return, to think about it. We're to be constantly in expectation. If watching and ready, we shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Mark 13:26. Dr. Andrew Boner tells the story of a humble man in one of the Scottish Presbyterian country kirks, which means church, by the way, who had learned this precious doctrine, and it meant much to him. While spending a weekend in Edinburgh, he decided to play the part of a sermon taster, and he went from church to church and told the people what he'd heard in the various churches of Edinburgh. They all fly on one wing, he said. They all preach the first coming of Christ, but not his second coming. There are too many preachers flying on one wing today. The prophecies of Jesus' first coming were fulfilled. There's no doubt about that. He came and died for our sins and made salvation possible. He came on time. He came to the right place. He did the right work. But his second coming is an important subject in the Bible, too. And that's still before us. There are too many preachers that neglect it. The prophecies of Jesus' second coming should be preached also. He came and died for us. He fulfilled those prophecies. Now he's fulfilling the other prophecies also. Nothing builds up evangelical warmth. Nothing stirs the hearts of God's people with missionary passion for the lost. Nothing gives a greater yearning for sanctification of life as much as does the realization of the great fact that Christ may return during our lifetime. Queen Victoria, who sat on the throne of Great Britain for over 60 years, was an earnest Christian. Not only did she love the cross of Christ, the story of his atoning sacrifice there for the people of this world, she also loved the glorious promise of his return to this earth, his second coming. On one occasion, she heard one of her chaplains, who was preaching at Windsor, Describe the second coming of our Lord. In fact, this was the subject of the entire discourse. She was the most attentive listener. And at the close of the sermon, she spoke to the preacher about the topic he had chosen and said, Oh, how I wish the Lord might come during my lifetime. Why, questioned the chaplain. Why, Your Majesty? Why do you feel this very earnest desire? With quivering lips, the queen replied, her countenance lighted with deep emotion. Oh, I should so love to lay my crown at his feet. It seems to me that all Christians should desire our Lord's soon return, that they may lay all that they have at his feet and thank him for what he's done for them. Shouldn't we all feel that way? Should we not read over and over these wonderful promises that Jesus made regarding his return to this earth? Should we not be watchful and waiting for him? studying these wonderful stories about his coming, how much it adds to life. My father was a minister for over 60 years and was often away from home weeks at a time in the service of Christ. In order to keep my brother and me in school, mother stayed with us and kept the little home together. At every opportunity, father would come home. How he loved to be with us and how we loved to have him come. We were poor in this world's goods. Most of the furniture was made of wooden boxes covered with cloth Mother knew just how to do it. I can still see the motto on the wall which read, Christ is the head of this house, the unseen guest at every meal, the silent listener to every conversation. This seemed to be sacred to my brother and me, to know that Jesus was there, even though we couldn't see him. And how we enjoyed family worship. Father made the Bible so interesting to us by just reading it simply. The love of God's good book, which Father's wise reading initiated, has not left me to this day. 
Sometimes, when Father had been gone for six or eight weeks, Mother would say, Father's coming home tomorrow. We have a letter from him. He would arrive by train. He would have to walk a mile or so, sometimes more, to our humble abode. We would wash things up. We'd wash ourselves. We wanted to be clean, wash the clothes, press our faces against the window and watch for him. Father's coming. Father will soon be here. Then we would see him turn the bend around the hill, carrying his heavy satchels. We could wait no longer, so we would be off to meet him, shouting with joy. Should it not be so regarding the coming of our Lord? Are you looking for him, waiting for him? What a day that will be. When that morning comes and the eastern heavens are all aglow with the radiant glory of his appearing, with all the holy angels with him, what a day. The dead in Christ shall rise first, and which we are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet him in the air. And may his blessing be upon every listener is our prayer in Jesus' name. Have faith in God. Someday Christ comes again. Have faith in God, the way we know, not when. Have faith in God, so walk in hope till then. Have faith, dear friend, in God. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, give us this faith. That we may be watching and waiting for our Lord's return. O oh God, remember the unwarned millions of the world. Help us to send the message forth by radio, by our testimony, by the Word of God. Bless every listener just now. We pray, dear Father, that we will earnestly want Jesus to come. In His name we ask it. Amen. Is your life so full of duties that your Lord is crowded out? Do you neglect to study and to pray? Or would your heart be ready and would glory fill your soul if Jesus would come for you? What an important question that is, friend. Do you really want Jesus to come? 
Perhaps as you listen today, you found yourself thinking, that all sounds good, but I want to know more. I want to know everything I can about the second coming of Jesus. If that's you, we have a book especially for you. It's entitled, Our Lord's Second Coming. This book lists in order every passage in the Bible that talks about the second coming. It's an excellent source for study and for encouragement. For your free copy of Our Lord's Second Coming, just call or write the Voice of Prophecy. Our address is the Voice of Prophecy, Box 55, Los Angeles, California, 90053. That's Box 55, Los Angeles, 90053. In Canada, write Box 2127, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H7V4. That's Box 2127, Oshawa, Ontario, L1H7V4. You can reach us by phone at 1-800-872-0055. That's 1-800-872-0055. Whenever you call or write, be sure to mention the call letters of this station. Our engineer is Armando Cordero. I'm Kenneth Richards. Next week, Lonnie Meloshenko will present another message in his series on prophecy. But now, here's a closing word from my father, the late HMS Richards, founder of The Voice of Prophecy. And now, friends, until we meet again, let us keep looking up. Yes, keep looking up, ever going forward in faith. There is a place of quiet rest Near to the heart of God Oh, Jesus Blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before Thee, near to the heart of God. According to an article in the March 7 issue of Rolling Stone magazine, the Christian right is, and I quote, the single most powerful political force in the country. Did you hear that? The Christian right is the single most powerful political force in the country. Now, all political commentary is given to exaggeration depending on the bias of the writer. And this critic may have overstated the strength of the Christian right to scare his readers into opposing the right. But still, it's a telling statement. If you're a Christian, how do you feel about the rising power of the Christian right? Are you excited or concerned? Historically, the Christian church has not handled political power well. Martin Luther approved the burning of Jews. John Calvin approved the execution of a man for his views on the Trinity. And the Church of Rome was responsible for the execution of some 50 million people during the Middle Ages. Do we really think we can avoid repeating history? Are we better than our spiritual ancestors? Let's beware of the seductions of earthly power. Christians are agents of a higher power. The church has greater weapons than mere ballots or bullets. For the Voice of Prophecy and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, this is Frank Gonzalez.